Welcome. I'm Lenny Martin Celebrant, and with us in the pulpit today is Reverend Catherine Burt from Vancouver, Washington. Welcome to the June 28th UUCS virtual Sunday service. Even though we can't see each other in person, I want everyone to feel welcome at our virtual services. We know you could be spending time doing something else, of course, wearing masks and social distancing. But you're here sharing worship with us, and we feel your loving presence. Thanks for joining us here. Most of you know me, or at least recognize me, since I've been part of the worship team for nine years and chair for five years. It's been my great blessing to be part of our UUCS community, and I treasure our experiences together. But as cycles begin, they also end. The time has come for my husband, David Gortner, and me to transition to our next cycle. We are moving to warmer climes in Southern California, a smaller city called Marietta. We bought a house in a senior 55 plus community and look forward to a simpler life. This move also brings us closer to family in San Diego. The hardest thing is leaving good friends in our beloved UUCS community know that I will carry you always in my heart. Our opening hymn today is, I Brought My Spirit to the Sea. It's number four in the gray hymnal. spirit to the sea I stood upon the shore I gazed upon infinity I heard the waters roar and then there came a sense of peace some whisper on my soul some ancient ministry of stars had made my spirit Oh, I brought my spirit to the trees that loomed against the sky. I touched each wandering careless breeze to know if God was nigh. And then I felt an inner flame that fiercely burned my tears. A bright I rose from bended knee to meet the asking years. Let us join in saying our affirmation. Love is our doctrine. Compassion is our way. Here we seek to create a joyful home for free religious exploration. Build a community of caring fellowship, nurture the hopes, and serve the needs of our world. Lighting a chalice symbolizes our Unitarian Universalist faith. Lighting a candle or lantern also symbolizes the light that guides us through dark and difficult places. Right now in our country and in the world, we are in such a place. May the glow of our chalice help us navigate through the zone of discomfort until we arrive in a safe haven.
We light the chalice for our UUCS congregation, for our partner church in Sheman Falls of Transylvania, Romania, and for the children of the world who will navigate us into the future. Don't forget that we have a children's family service on Sundays at 10 a.m., also using Zoom. Change, with all it brings, is an inevitable part of everyone's life. We all face losses and sorrows and through these find our way to compassion for others. In this time of disequilibrium, may we be ready to extend ourselves to those in need, and also be ready to receive with trust the hand that is offered to us. Bring to mind someone or something you would like to send compassionate support and hold them in your heart for a few moments. Change also brings new opportunities and renewal. It gives us friends to enjoy and things to anticipate and celebrate, for which we have gratitude. Let us reflect on what gives meaning to our lives, what brings joy and pleasure, and hold something or someone in mind for which you are grateful. We want to hear how you are doing. Please submit a joy or concern at our website. In a temporary state of grace, David Blanchard writes, most of us look for love in only the most obvious places. And as a result, most of us come away disappointed. It's as if we are still grade school kids, counting Valentine's as a measure of what matters. The love that matters is not typically the subject of sonnets or love songs. There can be love in being told we are wrong. There can be love in sharing a regret. There can be love in asking for help. There can be love in communicating hurt. There can be love in telling hard truths. Most of us find it painful to live at this level of love, but it can be there even in the most unlikely places. It isn't the kind of love we've been promised in fairy tales of princes and fairy godmothers, but it is the kind experienced by frogs and dwarfs. It's the sort of love that can bring us closer to finding the missing pieces of ourselves that we need to make us whole. Some of the most loving things I've ever experienced, I haven't been ready for, wasn't looking for, and nearly didn't recognize. A few of them I didn't want, but all of them have changed me, transformed some part of me, filled in a place that I didn't even know was empty. When the valentine has been tucked away in a drawer, the candy eaten 
the flowers faded and gone, there will be other legacies of love that will last as long as we do, because they have brought us to know an element of life, part feeling, part idea, and part mystery, that once known is ours to keep. And so ends the reading. The idea of a broken system is an illusion, according to the principles of adaptive leadership. Heifetz, Grashaw, and Linsky write that the reality is that any social system, including an organization or a country or a family, is the way it is because the people in that system, at least those with the most leverage, want it that way. Ouch. The implication, of course, being that institutionalized racism, state-sanctioned violence, is the way it is because the people in that system want it that way. There can be love in telling hard truths, David Blanchard tells us. Adaptive change is that change which, in order to happen, requires us to change. We're far more comfortable with technical problems which we can fix. Identify the problem, bring in the expert, and fix it. It's the adaptive challenges which are harder for us. They're harder, first of all, because our current paradigm and expertise does not work on them, so we don't know what to do and struggle even to figure out what the challenge really is. If we knew what it was, that would mean we had a working paradigm that could guide us. But instead, with adaptive challenges, we often don't know how to name the challenge, we don't know what to do, and we don't have an expert who can guide us. The expertise we do have worked in previous situations, but not in this situation. Because we don't really understand the scope of the challenge, we have to change. We have to be the ones to change ourselves and our thinking. We have to try some different experiments and we have to fail. We have to keep on task and not let ourselves get distracted by the problems that are easier to solve but don't matter as much. Some of the most loving things I've ever experienced I haven't been ready for, wasn't looking for, and nearly didn't recognize. A few of them I didn't want, but all of them have changed me, transformed some part of me, filled in a place that I didn't even know was empty, wrote David Blanchard. I think it's important to frame this discussion in love. There can be love in telling hard truths, says David Blanchard. Most of us find it painful to live at this level of love, but it can be there, even in the most unlikely places. We find ourselves in an unlikely, well, maybe not unlikely, but unfamiliar place these days preaching sermons from a chair at home or listening to sermons on a computer alone or with members of a single household, wearing a mask to go grocery shopping, holding committee meetings and family gatherings via Zoom. I don't know about you, but I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't looking for it and don't always recognize the love in it. But it is an act of love that we stay at home or limit travel, distance ourselves from others and wear a mask. Doing these things doesn't eradicate the virus, it just mitigates the spread, flattens the curve as they say, so that the hospital ICU units don't get overloaded all at once. It's an act of love for the healthcare workers who put themselves at risk by going to work and couldn't do their jobs if all of us needed their care at once. It's an act of love for the grocery store workers who put themselves at risk by going to work and others in, quote, essential services. We also find ourselves in an all too 
familiar place. With the protests sparked by the death of George Floyd, but preceded by so many deaths and followed by more, this is a familiar place that each time we say must be the last. I've been remembering my trip to Ferguson in 2015 at the year anniversary of the killing of Michael Brown. I went with a member of the church I was serving at the time and gathered with many Unitarian Universalists from across the country. We've we were been reminded in this news this last week when the president held a rally of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre and can't but note that a pandemic preceded that violence by a few years. We are in all too familiar a place. For those of us for whom the system has mostly worked, we need to change and be transformed. Present adaptive challenges we face include how to slow the rate of global climate change, eliminate racism and state-sanctioned violence, other isms and human rights violations, this virus. You could argue that the virus is a technical problem, one that we hope will be solved with treatments, cures, and vaccines, but it is also an adaptive challenge in that until such technical fixes can be created, we are going to have to adapt to its existence. We have never before solved global climate change. We've only created it. We don't really know how to do it. And though there are lots of things we know to do, we have to change our habits in order to do them. And although there are lots of things we know to do, we don't know if those things will be enough or what else there is to learn and do. In order to continue to work on adaptive challenges such as racism or global climate change, we have to maintain a certain urgency about the challenges and sustain the discomfort of not knowing. We have to try a lot of experiments and we have to learn from the failures of those experiments until we find things that work. This zone of discomfort, you may have guessed from my title, can be called productive disequilibrium. Productive disequilibrium can exist within our bodies, within our families, our congregations, our nation, our world. And learning to manage that disequilibrium is one of the greatest tasks of being human. It is through that zone of productive disequilibrium, for example, that children acquire language. There has to be an urgency, not knowing, experimentation, and failures along the way. I'm going to show you a slide here which I found helpful to understand the concept better. And I'll put it into words for those who can't see the slide very well. It, we have a graph. So the horizontal, let's see, the horizontal axis is one of time, left to right, less to more. And the vertical axis describes balance. The bottom of the line is comfortable and balanced, easy. And the top of the line is complete chaos an imbalance so great we can't generally tolerate it for long. But what I want to talk about this morning is about the third of the way down, this green section, this zone of productive disequilibrium where it's uncomfortable but tolerable. Like, you know, balancing on top of a ball, very hard to do, and we feel like we're going to fall over any second, but with practice, possible. Nevertheless, uncomfortable. Productive distress, it's also called. And then on this graph with the horizontal axis of time and vertical axis from balance to chaos, there are some graphing lines. And there's this thin line that starts at the bottom near equilibrium and goes upward into the zone of complete imbalance and chaos and goes pretty rapidly down to the bottom of the chart of equilibrium. That's what happens when we, when we are faced with a technical problem, like I'm faced with right now. I'm having a hard time finding my place in my script. It's a technical problem and I'll figure it out. 
Another technical problem is figuring out how to hold worship when we can't meet in a sanctuary. That was a technical problem, which many congregations, including the one I serve and yours, solved by implementing Zoom. But I found it interesting preparing for the service the different ways we've implemented that technical solution in each congregation. For example, I'm recording this sermon on Sunday, June 21st, even though you're watching me on June 28th. So on June 28th, I'll actually be leading worship in both Salem and Vancouver because we lead worship in real time in Vancouver, even though it's through the same Zoom format. So mostly this is a technical problem and many of us have been learning technologies we never before thought we wanted to know, but the ways in which we're implementing those technologies, we are adapting our way of worship. That is adaptive. And I want to talk again about that frame of love. I don't know about this congregation, but in Vancouver, I have felt more love and appreciation for the worship services we've prepared since moving onto this platform. People are grateful for the means to connect, even though the technology may have been unfamiliar at the start. That same thin line that starts at the bottom of the chart where everything is fine and dandy, feels good and in balance, and describing an adaptive challenge, shoots up the chart quickly, getting into the zone of disequilibrium and making us all uncomfortable. The protests in Ferguson following the murder of Michael Brown, the protests all over the world following the murder of George Floyd get up into this too hot zone and there's extreme pressure to resolve and return to equilibrium, which means returning the social system to what is familiar the way it was because the people in the system with the most leverage wanted it that way. That would be that purple line labeled in their work avoidance. It doesn't help with the adaptive challenge, but it does restore somewhat our sense of calm and balance, at least for those who are not on the receiving end of the injustice every single day. It could be argued that the Wilmington Massacre of 1898, the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921, when mobs of white residents attacked and murdered black residents and destroyed businesses, were attempts to restore the balance because those in power or with the most leverage wanted to restore the social system to the way they wanted it. Basically, they didn't want an end to slavery but to continue the commoditization of black bodies. We've been avoiding the work of anti-racism for a very long time. We've been avoiding the work of human rights for all humans, humanization, conscientization, or critical consciousness, to borrow the term from educator Paulo Freire. Collective liberation, I think, is our current terminology. We've been avoiding the work for a very long time. There can be love in telling hard truths, says David Blanchard. Most of us find it painful to live at this level of love, but it can be there, even in these most unlikely places. This has been a stressful time for many of us, what with the pandemics of COVID and racism raging in the world, distressful distressful. And this rush to return to normal, though expected, though understandable, is probably work avoidance. Because it is in this distressful time, if we make it productive, that we could actually adapt as a species change in a way that prevents the next violence. In order to make progress on the uncomfortable issue of racism, we have to stay in that zone of discomfort quite a long time in order to maintain a sense of urgency while not knowing what to do next and experimenting a lot and learning from our failures along the way. Most of us find it painful to live at this level of love. I've found this chart helpful on so many levels in dealing with my own anxiety when I don't know what to do next because I'm faced with an adaptive challenge. 
rather than blaming myself for my inadequacies, remember love is the key here, or blaming the world for its failures, I'm able to tolerate the dis discomfort long enough to make some progress on whatever adaptive challenge I'm facing, whether it's changing my personal habits, um, you know, too little exercise, too much work, or at work tolerating the inevitable criticism that comes my way as the most public representation of a very imperfect human institution. And knowing that the discomfort is a part of making progress toward adaptive change is one strategy I use for tolerating it just a little bit longer. My purpose this morning is to help us focus on how to mobilize and sustain ourselves through this period of risk that it comes with adaptive change. To understand that this distress can be productive and is an act of love. I believe our survival as a species depends on our ability to do this. Our survival as individuals depends on our ability to do this. And our survival as an institution depends on our ability to do this. The church is always in the process of facing adaptive challenges, some of which we are aware, others which remain hidden to us. This theory, as I've mentioned, applies on multiple levels in our lives and as a species. The obvious change we're undergoing right now is church without the building. I mean, we always knew that the building was not the church, but we are now having to learn in, lean into that truth in a new and different way. And I wonder what effect this challenge, centering church on the people rather than the building, will have on the other challenge we've been stating and struggling with for years, that progress we seek in inclusion, anti-racism, multiculturalism, transgender and gender non-binary inclusion, neurodiversity, ability, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And there is not a known route to inclusion the way we dream of it. And so we screw up not knowing what we don't know and forgetting at times to center the experience of those that we seek to include rather than continuing to center the white cisgender temporarily able-bodied experience that still makes up the majority of our congregations and our ministers and leaders such as myself. We are fish in the water. And we don't even know the, the water that we're in. And change is what this is about. It's what will allow us to survive as individuals, as species, as an institution. This change moment has been magnified by the pandemic, but things are always changing. The institution has undergone considerable change over the years. The institutions to which we belong were changing long before any of us arrived and will be changing long after we're gone. And some of it is quite uncomfortable. We're still in disequilibrium over several issues in Unitarian Universalism. I say this to you in love, including this adherence to rigid individualism, the reticence to submit ideas to the collective wisdom, the desire for increasing inclusivity without letting it actually change us. If we ease the tension too soon, find a temporary place of comfort, we may fail to make the long-term changes necessary to solve and adapt to a new world. The nature of adaptive challenges is that we don't really understand the scope of the challenge. So if I could better name the challenges we face, that would be a sign that they're fixable and technical. So if you think I'm only kind of hinting at difficulties here, you're right. We don't really understand the scope of the challenge. Because we don't, we have to change ourselves and our thinking. We have to try some experiments and fail. We have to keep on task and not let ourselves get distracted by the tasks that are easier to figure out 
but don't matter as much. It's not helpful, not loving, to think the system is broken and that we have to fix it. It's not an act of love to expect perfection and to rely on expertise. It's much harder than that. We are a part of the system and nobody knows what's next. I invite you into a time of silence now, a moment to check in with your body and any sensations you notice arising from my words this morning. Notice how your body has reacted and tap into the feelings rather than the thoughts. I'll begin and end the silence with the sound of the singing bowl. Ours is a generous congregation. Each week we donate to sustain our church activities and to help others in our greater community. This month's Share the Plate recipient is the Nellie Thompson Dorothy Patch Scholarship Fund. This nonprofit organization based in Salem provides scholarships to ethnic minority students in the area to pursue college or technical degrees. They have operated for 20 years and given scholarships to over 160 students to further their education. Your support helps minorities overcome adversity and build a career. You can send checks or donate to the UUCS website as you see on this slide. You can go to the UUSalem.org website and click the donations link or mail checks to the UUCS office. Your contributions can be for Marion Pope Food Share as well as the UUCS Church and the Nellie Thompson Dorothy Patch Scholarship Fund. Thank you all for your generosity and commitment to our church and greater community. Before extinguishing the chalice, let us remember that it also symbolizes the social justice work we carry out into the world. Although the chalice is extinguished, the guiding light that it symbolizes burns brightly before us. This flame carried in our hearts and minds will help us navigate through the zone of discomfort and find our way to productive disequilibrium. May you continue to gather in sacred community. You will ever remain part of my life and have a treasured place in my heart. Our closing hymn today is There Is More Love Somewhere. 
It's number 95 in the gray hymnal. say together our closing words. May faith in the spirit of life, hope for the community of earth, and love for the sacred in one another be ours now and in all the days to come.